<laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Marin Energy Authority Board meeting for Thursday, April 5th, 2012. Uh, we'll start with item one, board announcements. Doesn't look like we have any this evening. So item two, public open time. Gene Dyer. <coughs> Get right up into that microphone. I previously called your attention that several major U.S. solar panel manufacturers filed a complaint that they were being harmed by Chinese who were illegally dumping solar panels into the U.S. solar market. That the U.S. International Trade Commission had initiated an investigation into this claim of illegal dumping. I also suggested that we require all new bidders to provide information relative to the source of the solar panels that would be used in their proposed projects. Last month, a preliminary decision was announced, finding both that the Chinese producers had received government subsidies and that this was harming the U.S. solar manufacturing industries. Further, the U.S. Customs has been instructed to collect a cash depositor bond applicable to all entries of Chinese solar panels starting in late December. Lastly, they announced that the determination of any anti-dumping import duty would be completed by midsummer. These developments should cause several concerns to you. First, the expected tariffs will likely impact the, impact the economic feasibility of those solar projects for which you already have contracts, but are still under construction and all the panels aren't here yet. Second, those who have recently provided you with new proposals for added solar panel related contracts may need to rethink their pricing proposals. Third, you might even want to review whether you want to continue to subsidize individual house installations that use illegally imported panels. <coughs> Lastly, you have an ethical problem. For your continuation with projects which use illegally dumped Chinese solar panels, is now clearly forcing the fledgling U.S. solar panel manufacturers to close some of their panel production facilities. If your real goal is to, is to do things to check global warming, it would seem that diverting your purchasing power to Chinese interests and thereby shutting down the U.S. manufacturers is an odd way to achieve your goal. Buyers deserve the sellers that they support and soon find that there are no other sellers. I would recommend that rather than trying to hide this subject from the public, that you develop a policy relative <coughs> to contracting with those who propose to use illegally dumped solar panels as a guide to your staff for their various procurement recommendations. And as an added thought, you already provide a premium to the local renewable gener generator. You might also consider something similar for suppliers who promise to use U.S. manufactured solar panels. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dyer. Any other members of the public? And this is on items not on the agenda. Um, Good evening. Yeah, I want to add on to the solar. Stan, if you can just say your name as well. Stan Sparrow. Hi. Uh, good evening. Yeah, the solar industry has taken a real beating all across the nation. All the utilities are ganging up and trying to get rid of net metering. San Diego Power Company is wanting to add on twenty or thirty dollars to people who are net generators because they're using the wires. And um, the uh, grant subsidy is gone. The, um, um, the rate structure in August is not favoring the solar industry, so it's really taking a beating. And um, it breaks my heart. It's in renewable energies and the uh, San Onofre, they won't tell you how much nuclear it leaked, but um, my nuclear scientist friend is on it down there, and um, the Fukushima, or Nukushima, is not looking good at all. It's pretty scary. And they had another big earthquake, just have a one year anniversary. And I'm glad that you guys have gone non nuclear. That's why I'm here, is to fight nuclear. And you're doing a great job. Um, another new thing is a lot of people are getting calls. Um, and I had 
thought it was pg e calling me, but it was some uh, another utility competition that the CPUC spanked pg e for their gas gouging and blowing up people. And um, so now there's private gas companies. There's five different ones. This one is a good deal here. And they're uh, 27 cents a therm for their natural gas, whereas pg e is 47 cents a therm right now. That's quite a difference. And so that's you know, like um, 55, 60% of pg and &E and um, um, you can ask me for more details offline, but just giving you an idea of the chaos in the market right now, and you guys are doing a great job if you can uh, hang in there and <coughs> deal with the issues coming up with the CPUC and continue to support solar industry, and um, um, thank you. Thanks for that information. Anyone else? Uh, Damon, in the public? may I yes. ask a question, Mr. Dyer? Sure. Uh, Gene, in, in your statement here on point three, you say that uh, do we want to continue to subsidize the individual house installations that are using illegally imported solar panels, which implies that right now it is illegal, but up in your, your uh, higher in your statement here, it says the, um, they further announced the preliminary determination in the companion anti-dumping duty investigation will be announced on May 17th, 2012. Can we say it's actually illegal at this time if they panels have not made a determination? Panels, panels that have come in before this time were illegal. So they have been judged illegal already, is that correct? It's a preliminary de decision, yes. Well, should we not wait until the decision is final before we make some... That's your judgment. Okay. David. Yes. I, they, I have a board announcement. The number one went by me a little quick. Okay. If that's okay. Um, it's just a brief. I presented the um, the rate uh, or the opt out letter that's I guess was mailed out today. Um, and so I just have some comments from my council just briefly, and perhaps other folks have presented their opt out letters to their councils as well. But the two comments that uh, that we had one was a question was is that for some folks, I, we see in the letter, of course, the options for uh, rate payers to opt out if they choose to. One is calling and the other is the website. And, um, and my counsel was questioning whether or not there should be a postcard opportunity or something because perhaps there are some rate payers that aren't comfortable talking on the phone and aren't web uh, uh, conversant, but if they checked a box on a po postcard, and so I'm just throwing that out that was one comment that we had, and the second one was from one of my colleagues, um, who was uh, suggesting that the that the letter, uh, the opt out letter, wasn't particularly clear in helping a ratepayer determine um, a comparison of rates between PG&E and, and MCE. When you when you look at it, just simply, it just says competitive, but it doesn't really give any information or how perhaps that a, a person wanting to make an informed decision on what they want to do. And so those were the two comments that I passed back for everyone that I heard from my council. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Item three, report from executive officer, Don. Okay, um, I just have a couple of quick items today, mainly related to upcoming events. So I wanted to report that the city of Richmond is going to be holding a council meeting on April 17th, where they are they expect to be taking up the ordinance uh, uh, to uh, approve a CCA program in their jurisdiction and a resolution requesting to join MEA. So um, we'll be participating in that meeting and we'll report back. Um, we also have a couple of uh, workshops coming up here in Marin that kind of go along with our rollout of Phase 2B. We have a workshop planned for Nevada, Ross, and Fairfax. And um, Jamie may have more information. She wants to report on those. Um, also, we have very exciting news about the notices going out today, which Ken alluded to. Jamie, do you want to comment? Um, yeah, just in addition, uh, so our first opt-out notice was mailed out today, which is really <coughs> exciting. Uh, 
Uh, so customers will be receiving them as early as tomorrow and then probably trickling through the beginning of next week, which means that you might be contacted by constituents in your communities. So um, please feel free to pass on questions to our office. We're happy to field those. And um, you've all had a chance to review the opt-out notice, um, but it provides direction on how to opt out if you don't want to participate, which is through our call center or through our website. And we're excited about the three community meetings that we have scheduled. Um, and I believe I sent out the dates in an email to you all last week. Um, so we're looking forward to participating in those. And that's it for the report. Um, one question, Jamie. So I know um, the board and staff have put a lot of effort into um, at least one or two charts that kind of talked about how our rates compare. Um, what's the status of that and then also availability of that kind of information? Yeah, actually, uh, one other thing that was really exciting that happened today was that we launched our new and improved website. So if you go home or uh, tonight or tomorrow and check and out... We'll get you home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you hear the yeah. <laughs> Or tomorrow. Clarification. <laughs> and uh, visit marinecleanenergy.com. You'll see the new website. And uh, the rates page has been updated, and it, it includes those charts. Uh, that we discussed with the finalized versions with everyone's input that we've been collecting. Um, so you can find those up on the website and you can also direct constituents to that page. It's just marinecleanenergy.com forward slash rates. So it's a pretty easy page to get to. Then ultimately some sort of rate calculator is still in the work. That would be something that we could implement in July after our okay. rates have gone to a, a flat rate. All right. Great. Um, any questions for Jamie or Don? Yeah, um, uh, Larkspur doesn't want to be left out on the community uh, outreach programs, and I understand that uh, perhaps our city manager wasn't wasn't responsive, but I talked to him yesterday, and, and we definitely would like to have one in Larkspur as well. Wonderful. Sounds great. Sounds we'll follow. Up, should, we'll follow up with you about that. Thank you. Great. Anyone else? Any members of the public? on Don's report? Okay. <clears throat> we'll move on to item four, the consent calendar, and just, uh, if you'll note, item C3 is being continued. Um, so all the items except for item um, C3. That's being taken out? Yes, and that will be continued to a, a different date. Anyone have any questions? On that? the items that weren't taken out? Correct. So you did on C3. I, C3, I did have them. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Save those for I'll uh, wait there. another day. Um, well, how about a motion to approve? On the I would like to move that we approve the consent calendar um, absent uh, item C3. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Opposed? I'm at Okay, item five, appointment of board members to standing and ad hoc committees. Okay, so we just have um, one change being proposed tonight uh, as far as our committees. Um, Director uh, Leon is uh, unable to continue on the technical committee and will be uh, stepping down from that committee. Um, Director Bragman uh, is interested in being on the technical committee and has offered to um, sit on that committee starting on May 1st. So um, won't be able to join us this month, uh, but as of May, we'll, we'll be able to join that committee. Um, so that's the only change um, this evening. Um, Yordice just passed out a, a sheet that, that might help for reference to know who's on what committee, and it um, uh, reflects the, pr the change that we're proposing this evening. Uh, do we now have a full roster? No, we still have an open seat on the technical committee. So okay, we'd, we'd love so to we get have what four? And I'll see this in a minute. Here's your so, okay. So TechCom, how many more do we need? One. We need one, one more. One. Well, two until maybe after. Okay, so one more with uh, Larry now added, and otherwise it looks like full of slate. So um, again, and if anyone has an interest in the TechCom, uh, it's a great place to serve. Uh, a lot gets done there, so keep it in mind. Um, but does anyone else have any other 
questions or issues or no, requests. Not on. What day uh, does the tech con meet? Or what's the schedule? The, the third Tuesday of the month at 9 a.m. And, and we do, our policy is to, to try and accommodate the schedules of committee members. So if there is a need for a change, we could look at other dates. Yeah, did we talk about tech on? No. No. No, and just, just a correction, my, my last name is with an A-S. Thank you. Very good. Oh, yeah, since we're on last name corrections. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you got mine right once and wrong once. Yeah. It's got three E's. There you go. Where's <laughs> okay. Don, do any of these committees meet other than mornings and early afternoon? The ad hoc committees will often meet um, at a variety of times. They don't have a set time, so they're kind of called together as needed and as uh, the committee members are available. Um, the, the executive committee and the tech committee have typically met on weekday mornings, um, but as I mentioned, there, there could be some flexibility there if needed. Okay. Can we just so that I can write in one place when we, if you can tell us when each committee meets and just write just write in one place? Sure. The, the two standing committees have regular meetings. So the executive committee meets on the third Wednesday of each month at 10 a.m. The technical committee meets on the, the third Tuesday of each month at 9 a.m. The ad hoc committees are ad hoc and don't have a set meeting times. So they're called together as needed. So keep the tech calm in mind, everyone. And uh, do we have any other further questions or comments on the committee roster? So do we need a motion, Don? Okay. How about a motion? What are we motioning? Okay. Approval of, of Director Brown. So, uh, so, so, oh, 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 is that? Yeah, oh, so we'll that? add him formally. Second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed? That matter carries. All right, item six, which is going to be a great item to report on, is the Charles F. McGlashan Advocacy Appreciation Award. And we're very pleased and honored this year to give the second annual award to the Main Street Moms. And uh, who's here from the group tonight? All right, we've got, oh my goodness, we've got some numbers tonight. All right. Well, uh, in just a minute, I'm going to uh, give you the award, but I wanted to, and we have a certificate as well as a plaque that actually hangs in our uh, our boardroom in the office, which is the Charles McGlashan room, and uh, it will actually have the name Main Street Moms on it uh, for this year. So I uh, just wanted to say a few things about you guys. Um, the Main Street Moms has a broad and deep history with several years of involvement and commitment leading to the launch and continued success of Marine Clean Energy. The organization advocated fiercely against Prop 16 in 2010, uh, thereby encouraging the development of community choice aggregation programs throughout California. And I think many of us remember, of course, the iconic uh, photos of Megan and, and the rest of you out there with your signs, you know, uh, protesting at various uh, uh, community events and meetings where, you know, the incumbent utility was really trying to get this thing passed and, and we beat it back. Uh, Main Street Moms has dedicated countless hours to volunteering, educating, and promoting Marine Clean Energy's deep green program at community events. And I was just informed tonight that you're going to be running an ad actually to encourage people to opt up to deep green. So we really appreciate that. Main Street Moms also utilizes their website as a means of promoting Marine Clean Energy and has even obtained a grant to help support their efforts to promote MCE. Their hard work has resulted in the enrollment of several new Deep Green customers, and we're hoping that continues. It's apparent to all of us that Main Street Moms have demonstrated the passion, dedication, and leadership in promoting MCE that was exemplified by the late Charles McGlashan, former chair of MEA. Charles passed away on March 27 last year, so it's time <laughs> that we honor him and an organization that is so devoted to the success of MCE. 
if Charles were here today, he would be so very proud of the achievements made over the last year and of those to come, especially in relation to our increased renewable energy content and our full rollout of MCE that will include all of the cities and towns in Marin County. Charles knew well the work that the mainstream moms had been doing to help get us off the ground for several years, and I know how grateful he was. So it's with great pleasure that we recognize the Main Street Moms as the second recipient of the Charles F. McGlashan Award. Congratulations. <laughs> Come by the office and check it out. Yeah. And we actually need to take action on that. Okay. Okay, Director Athis has moved. Second. Okay. Actually, yeah, well, it's Steve. Yeah. Director Hartwell Herrera. You can stay. We have to go on <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all in favor of that item? Yes. Aye. Aye. Yeah. Opposed? The matter carried. It's going to be tough if we go to the Okay. <laughs> item seven renewables portfolio standard comparative analysis. All right. So, th this item here is just a. Uh, to provide you with some information, I think now this is about the fourth time that we've prepared this uh, comparative analysis. And, and really this analysis stems from a reporting requirement that, uh, that's related to California's renewable portfolio standard. And uh, one of the things that, that's required of entities that serve customers or electric load within the state of California is the submittal of, of two different reports during the year. It's a semi-annual reporting process. Um, these reports provide an indication to the California Public Utilities Commission as to how much renewable energy as a percentage of, to of the total provided to customers is uh, delivered from California eligible renewable energy sources. And so uh, Marin submitted its first of the two semi-annual reports for 2012 on March 1st. The other will be due on August 1st. Um, they were one of 17 entities that submitted reports during this time. And uh, there were some changes in the current reporting process and the template itself actually changed quite a bit. And uh, that was substantially the result of some changes to the renewable portfolio standard that 
were signed into law by Governor Brown on April 12th of 2011 as part of uh, SB 2 1X. And one of the key provisions in that legislation was an increase in California's renewable portfolio standard to 33% by 2020. Um, there were some other requirements that went in there as well with some interim procurement targets leading up to the 2020 33% um, target, but uh, that's certainly the mo most no noteworthy change there. So as I mentioned, 17 entities submitted reports on March 1st. Um, MEA in its report indicated that it procured nearly 28% of its total energy supply from eligible, eligible renewable sources, and, and this should come as no, no surprise to those in the room that that was far and away the highest percentage of any jurisdictional entity reporting on March 1st. Um, there is the, the summary report that's in front of you tonight on page one has a bar chart that, that I think is, is, uh, is pretty useful to take a look at there, and you can see how MEA compares to California's three largest investor-owned utilities in the state, PG&E, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric Company. This bar chart up here we'll talk about in just a second. Um, but the bar chart that I'm referring to now simply indicates that, again, MEA is really head and shoulders above its peers in terms of renewable energy procurement, exceeding the efforts of PG&E by over 38 percent, the efforts of Southern California Edison by nearly 32 percent, and the efforts of San Diego Gas and Electric Company by 33 and a half percent. So, uh, again, really far and away the leader here. One thing to point out, and I, I think it's uh, this is really a positive development, is that for the first time since MEA has tracked renewable energy progress in these reports in particular since uh, 2008, this is the first time that the, uh, the investor-owned utilities have met the 20 percent procurement target. So, you know, I think really kudos to them for that. Um, one of the things that we have observed was that a lot of the contracts that they entered into um, began delivering in 2011. So they really had a boost in terms of their supply as a result of their previous contracting efforts uh, that led to that 20 percent uh, target and achievement there in, in 2011. One of the other things that's, uh, that's mentioned here in the report, and I, I think it's, it's worth noting, is that as a result of our, our deep green program, we procure quite a bit of additional renewable energy above and beyond what's required um, by the, the state's renewable portfolio standard. And if you include those purchases above and beyond what we already purchased to meet the state's renewable portfolio standard, um, we're at 36 percent of our total portfolio from uh, supply from renewable energy sources, and, and, and that's, a, that's a pretty great thing. There's some, some pie charts here in the report that also detail out where it is that our renewable energy is coming from, both the, the RPS eligible sources as well as the other renewable energy. And uh, we, we do have a bit of diversity in our supply, which is nice, and, uh, and, and, and certainly I think this is, a, as it has been in the past, a, a very you know, positive um, report for MEA to file and, and certainly a, a fun comparison to, uh, to perform. This chart up here, I think, is also interesting. It, th this is really a look forward. Um, while it does include our procurement efforts in 2011, this kind of shows our transition as we move toward the 2020 33% uh, RPS requirement. And one thing that's important to keep in mind is that you'll read the bar chart off the right axis and the line chart off the le left axis. And so the line chart is simply uh, provides an indication of how our customer energy requirements are growing um, over time here. We have a planned expansion uh, mid-year this year, and then of course in 2013 will be a kind of full uh, steady state customer enrollment for the, for the duration of that entire year. And you can see how our renewable energy procurement efforts as a result of your board's decision to move to a 50 percent uh, renewable energy target for our light green customers really steps us up and, and gets us very near uh, 60 percent as we move forward. So um, as you would reasonably expect, we're going to continue to try to uh, better our efforts as we, as we move along, but, uh, but I think this is really a good story to tell here and it shows how it is that we're meeting both the needs of our, uh, our compliance program as well as the voluntary needs uh, of our customers and the decisions made by this agency. So 
think that's really it on this uh, this item. Any questions? That's great. Is any questions for Kirby? All right. Well, this is this is really outstanding. Actually, I have one question. Yeah. Um, to what extent do you think that Marin Energy Authority taking the lead has something to do with bumping up the ratios of the investor-owned utilities? Well, you know, it, it's an interesting uh, question that you ask, and in fact, I, I just got an email while we were at dinner that was indicating that PG&E might have a voluntary green pricing program in the works now. So I, I think it's safe to say that um, you know, the ball that MEA has, uh, has been rolling along here is, is starting to gain some momentum and it's certainly um, starting to have some positive effects elsewhere as well. So. It sounds like we're well on track to meet the uh, updated 33% standard, is that right? Yeah, and as a matter of fact, where we, we sit today relative um, to future standards, we've actually already hit the 2017 um, interim target. Right, right in 2011. So That's we're, right. We're well in advance of schedule. Okay. And of course, we're hoping that the other utilities do as well. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Any uh, questions or comments from the public on this item? <coughs> okay, so this is a discussion item. Um, let's move on to item 8. Resolution 2012-11 of the board uh, adopting Marine Clean Energy customer rate change for fiscal year 2013. So this is the third time this item has come before us. Is that, a time? that is correct. So that's, uh, as you said, it's the third time that we've talked about the rate change formally here at the board level. We've also discussed it quite a bit at, at committee. Um, so I'll just start with a a little bit of review on, on uh, a little bit of background in the process, our rate setting process before we, we dive into the, to the meat of this. But um, you know, we, we look at our rates uh, typically in January. We're on an annual rate setting cycle. And um, the first look at our rates is we say, relative to what we think the coming year's budget's gonna be, are, are our rates sufficient? Are they gonna collect the proposed budget or the preliminary budget um, or not? So that's kind of the, the first look at it and then we also look at other rate setting objectives that we have and this slide lists some of the the key objectives and, and these are um, policies really that flow from from the MCE implementation plan but um, you know these include rate competitiveness so generally that means how are we comparing to the main alternative to us which is of course uh, PG&E service and rate stability so uh, our bias is to maintain rates so that we uh, are able to offer a, a kind of a stable pricing structure to the customer. Um, and so, you know, when we're talking about rate stability, we're comparing how would a rate change compare to what is currently into effect. Um, and then we, we look at uh, another objective we have is customer understanding. And this generally translates into simplicity. We try and keep our rates as simple as possible um, you know, it's not always easy in this industry, but that's our goal, is to simplify the rates to the extent that we can. And then the last major consideration is, is customer equity. And the, um, the primary sort of uh, metric for this is a cost of service. How do our rates, how do the differences, that we, the, the price differences that we have in our rate structure, um, are those justifiable by looking at the differences in cost to serve customers. So that's that's kind of the, the main lens for considering um, equity among customers in, in the rate structure. Now we, uh, we we provide a 60 day review period before the board finalizes rates. And so um, the preliminary rates were presented at the February board meeting and that, that kicked off the 60 day review period. And at that time, um, we were projecting that we'd be reducing, or the rates that we presented would be um, uh, on average 7% lower than the rates that are currently in, in effect. Uh, and then in uh, the next meeting, last meeting in March, we updated the, the proposed rates for the fiscal year. And um, we now had an unapproved budget, so we made some additional changes. We were able to lower the, the proposed rates consistent with that budget. So. Um, now the rates are, on average, on a system average basis, 11% lower than the rates that are currently in effect. 
So those are the rates that are on the agenda today. We haven't made any subsequent changes to, the, to those rates. Um, so they're recommended for approval tonight. <coughs> in terms of the, the major changes uh, in this year's rates relative to, to the past, uh, and a couple of sort of macro changes here would be obviously the expansion. Um, big reason we're able to bring our rates down is by scaling up and being able to gain some efficiencies there in, in the recent power purchase agreement that we, um, that we executed enables those, those lower costs and that translates into lower rates. And then the other big sort of macro issue is the um, our uh, flattening of our residential rate. So uh, this is largely in response to the next bullet on this list, which was the, the, um, the plan for PG&E to move the rate tiering for residential customers from the generation side of the bill to the non-generation side of the bill. Um, so in response, we are, we are flattening our generation rate. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We've, I know we've, we've covered that quite a bit in the past as well. Uh, also, uh, along the same lines are the care discounts. So these are the discounted rate for low-income, qualifying low-income customers. And um, along with the, the, uh, the moving of the tiering to the non-generation side or the PG&E side of the bill, um, the care discount will also be moved to the non-generation side of the bill. So going forward as of July, uh, the entirety of the care discount, and it's the same amount, the customer is still going to receive the same amount of the discount, but it's, it's all going to be reflected on the PG&E side of the bill. That's, a, that's another change. And, um, and then the last change is our proposed rates would be effective in July. And that's a little unusual. Typically, they would be effective at the start of the fiscal year, which is April. Uh, but considering this unique need to coordinate with the PG&E rate changes, um, and also our expansion, these rates would go into effect in July. So this schematic here um, describes the rate setting process. And uh, there's, there's really multiple steps here, but the, the first step in the process is it starts with our sales forecast. So we look at, okay, over the next 12 months, what are we uh, projecting in regards to our customer base the amount of kilowatt hours they're going to consume, um, it's, you know, all the other billing determinants, all the other um, quantities that, that our rates apply to. Um, that's the, the starting point. And then we uh, associate with that would be a revenue forecast using our current rates and that sales forecast, how much uh, revenue do we project that we would collect. Then we look at the budget or the um, or what we call the revenue requirement. And um, so in the, in, in the case of today's rates, based on our forecasted sales, uh, we would collect 80, was it 82 or 81, $81.5 million. Okay. <coughs> That's if we didn't change our rates. Um, then what our revenue requirement actually is, is $72.5 million. So that's, that's where the opportunity comes in, uh, where we can lower our rates and still recover our, our overall costs. So um, the, the current rate, or on a system average rate, programmatically, uh, the overall average is 7.8 cents per kilowatt hour. And under the proposed rate, our average system rate is 6.9 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's basically uh, simply a function of our projected power supply costs and other costs in our, in our projected customer base. That's the revenue requirement or the, or, the, or the budget part of the process. Then we get into the how we split that up to um, various customer groups and ultimately how, how the charges are designed for, for individual customers. So the, uh, the way it's done is um, we take the, the revenue requirements, so the $72.5 million, and then we allocate that to the nine different customer groups that we have. Um, these custom, we group customers based on you know, char uh, end use characteristics like residential, agricultural, street lighting, uh, that level. So we have nine customer groups that we allocate the revenue requirement to. And then from there, we design specific rate schedules. So we have nine rate groups, 
we have 27 race schedules. And the race schedules are where, you know, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. That's where you have the energy charges per kilowatt hour or demand charges per KW or customer charges. So th that's the way it works. Starts with the budget, revenue requirement, break it down, split it out to the groups, and then ultimately to the rate schedules and the charges. Go to the next slide, please. So in terms of you know, how we decide to allocate the revenues to the various groups, uh, the two primary considerations were uh, the cost of service and uh, a comparison to uh, essentially a competitive analysis or how the, how the rates compare to what PG&E is charging. So those were the two primary uh, considerations in, in, these, in, uh, in the FY 2013 rates. And so where we uh, have rate groups where the current rates are above what we estimate it costs to serve that customer group and also above what PG&E is charging, those are the rate groups that we're proposing to reduce. Okay, and so those are, there's four of them, residential, large commercial, the industrial, and the street lighting groups. The, all the other group, the, the remaining five groups, um, we're proposing no change in the rates at all. Go to the next one, please. So this table shows uh, the specifics, and you can see, you know, we've got the nine rate groups here. Uh, overall rate reduction of about nine million dollars, going from the eighty-one point five million to the seventy-two point five million, and um, the vast majority of that rate reduction would be uh, flowing through to the residential class through lower residential rates. And then uh, you can see the, the five rate groups, well, there, there'll be no <coughs> rate change whatsoever. Um, go to the next one, please. And then this table, this really s summarizes uh, where on, this is, n these, are, these are cents per kilowatt hour average rates now for the various rate groups. So this shows how under the proposed rates we would compare to, to the cost of serving those customers and how we would compare to PG&E. So, um, under the proposed rates, we're, we're pretty close. We're pretty close to both cost, and we're pretty close to, to PG&E for the most part. Overall, our system average rate, as I mentioned, would be 6.9 cents per kilowatt hour. PG&E is at about 6.8, so we're really close on, on average. Uh, and then by class, we're, we're pretty close as well. I think there, the one exception where we're a little off would be the agricultural class where we're, we're at 5.6 per kilowatt hour, and that's lower than what we would consider to be our cost, and it's also lower than the PG&E rate, but in the interest of rate stability and, and the fact that we don't have a whole lot of those customers, even at full rollout, we um, propose just to keep those rates constant. So I mentioned the 27 rate schedules that we have, and this is a list categorized by uh, the rates that are not changing, those that are decreasing, and those where there's a mix. And so um, 11 of the rate schedules, there's no change. Eight of the rate schedules will have decreases across the board. So every rate component within that schedule will be reduced by the same percentage. And then for the residential class, we have a mix, and this is where, because this is where we're changing the rate design, we're moving from the tiered rate to the flat rate. So we're having um, the lower, to the first two tiers, the, the rates are going up, and then the tiers three, four, and five, they're coming down. Go to the next one. <coughs> so we'll spend a little bit of time on, on the, the residential rate design here. So, um, you know, currently we have a five-tier structure. So within the month, more energy that a residential customer uses, um, they move into a higher price rate tier. And uh, we're replacing that with a flat rate, so it's just a single 6.9 cents per kilowatt hour for all energy that's consumed within the month. And, you know, this has a number of benefits. The, the primary one being, and this is really kind of the main driver of why we're doing this, but it, moving to a flat rate prevents a, a double-tiering effect. Is, now PG&E is going to be tiering or, or more <coughs> aggressively tiering the, the non-generation side of the bill. If we were to maintain our tier generation rate, then the customer would in effect be seeing a double tiering and that would have a detrimental bill impact for, for many of our customers. There are some other benefits though associated with this. One of them is um, it's much simpler for our customers and that fits in with, um, with, with one of our rate setting objectives. 
it stabilizes our cash flows and makes it a heck of a lot easier to forecast what our revenues are going to be from a month to month basis. Um, and it also enables easy comparisons for customers to compare our flat rate to PG&E. So uh, I think overall this will be a beneficial change for our customers. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the low income uh, discount and also the medical baseline discount, those will be fully reflected in, on the non-generation side of the bill starting in July. So this table, our, our um, primary rate schedule, the, the rate schedule that 90% of our customers um, are served on is the Res 1, so it's the equivalent of PG&E E1, and this shows the current rate and the proposed rate. So you can see where the, the current uh, rate is, is ranging from 3.7 cents a kilowatt hour up to 21.5 cents, and of course that'll, that'll move to a flat 6.9. Um, there's a, uh, the, um, this change, you know, it, it's increasing for the first two tiers and decreasing for the, for the upper three tiers. On balance for our existing customers, uh, the vast majority of them will see a lower bill, as a, a, a lower MCE charges, I should say, as a result of this change. 97% of our current customers on Schedule E1 will pay a lower bill as a result of our um, proposed rates. Now, uh, there are going to be changes on the PG&E side of the bill that's going to offset that. Uh, because whereas we're lowering our upper tier rates and we're increasing our lower tier rates, PG&E is doing the exact opposite. They're, they're increasing the upper tier rates on their side of the bill and, and reducing the first two tier rates on their side of the bill. So there's a netting effect where overall there shouldn't be much of an impact um, to the bottom line bill of the customer. So that's pretty much it actually. So uh, happy to take any questions you have. I, I just want to be sure that I understand it. It's safe to say that while we are getting less revenue because of these rate changes, the customer, the residential customer themselves aren't really going to see any significant change yes. in what they pay. Yeah, that is, um, for our current customers, I th that's largely correct because we're, we're reducing our rate um, for these customers. The changes on the PG&E side of the bill are offsetting that. And so I think on balance, they're not going to be seeing um, much of a reduction. So would it also be safe to say that a direct result of what PG&E is doing with their non-generation side is in fact making us reduce our MCE rates and get lower revenue? Well, it's... No, I wouldn't say that. It, it, what they're doing on the non-generation side is, is changing the way we structure the rate. I mean, that's, they're causing us to go from the tier to the flat. But our overall rate level, how much we collect, the 71.5 or 72.5 million, that really has nothing to do with what PG&E is doing. That's simply, um, you know, <coughs> based on our power purchase contracts and our other costs of running the agency, those, that's the revenue that we'll need to collect with our projected customer base. Okay, but if we had kept our rates the way, th if we had not reduced our rates, we would have been way more expensive because of what PG is doing with their non-generation side. Yeah, that, that's true, yes. Yeah. Okay. The so proposed rates were, were basically comparable, um, but we're reducing them by 11%. So if we weren't reducing by 11%, we would be you know, about that much higher than, than they are. Okay, thanks. Sure. Director Rebka? Yeah. I okay. Any other board members? Yeah, I think we, we had several good discussions about um, yeah. this item, and I want to compliment uh, John for his work on this, as well as the board. We've, we've had a, a robust discussion about this over several meetings now. Uh, how about members of the public on the rate, proposed rate design? Okay. Bringing it back then, it uh, looks like we need a motion for approval, and this is the final approval, approval at this point, is that correct? John? That's correct. Okay. I'll make the motion to approve. <coughs> second it. Got a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Opposed? Seeing none, that matter carries. All right, good job, everyone. 
Um, item nine, renewable energy certificate purchase and sale agreements with can, one Can I make one comment with regard to aid? Absolutely. I, I do thank staff for changing the charts from reduction in revenue to reduction in rates mm -hmm. on those, uh, yeah. on the, um, I guess the charts that you have, uh, the table one. I do, I do appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think that really clarifies. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so renewable energy certificate purchase and sale agreements with One Energy Inc. All right. So th actually, the next two agenda items are going to deal with a total of three agreements uh, for renewable energy procurement, uh, specifically renewable energy certificate procurement. And as you recall, your board very recently decided to move or increase the light green renewable energy content from 28% to 50%. And as you would reasonably expect, that will require some additional renewable energy purchases. And this decision was made by your board in consideration of uh, a number of factors, including the following. Uh, consistency with MEA's charter goals and objectives, uh, the low cost of incremental renewable energy procurement associated uh, with moving to the 50% target, increased uh, value to MCE customers, and, and more specifically, this represents an 85% increase in renewable energy supply to customers, accompanied by what I would characterize as a de minimis rate impact. And then, of course, in addition to the default renewable energy product now being 50%, we'll, of course, con continue to offer the 100% deep green option as well. So um, that will remain in place. So in, in order to address this increased need as a result of, of the decision to move to a 50% light green renewable energy content, uh, we have, staff has negotiated agreements for additional renewable energy certificate volumes with uh, some qualified suppliers. And this particular agenda item, it deals with a counterparty with, uh, with which we already have a contract. This is uh, One Energy, Inc. There are two agreements, really, that are, that are contemplated here. One is an extension of an existing agreement. So it would just be a new, a new confirmation, confirmation letter number two. Um, this is for, for Greeny Energy Certified Renewable Energy Certificates from wind resources located within Western Interconnection, or Western United States. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about renewable energy certificates now along the way, and, and the idea that uh, when renewable energy is produced, there, there's really two valuable commodities that, that come with that, the energy itself, and then the environmental benefit. And so when we buy uh, an unbundled renewable energy certificate, what we're really doing is, is taking title to that environmental benefit, taking responsibility for it. Here you're also noting though that they're California eligible, if you can kind of you know, Absolutely. explain that as well. Absolutely. And, and what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll deal with confirmation letter number two first, which is the Greeny Energy Certified. Those are, those are not um, okay. California RPS eligible. And then we'll, we'll take that RPS eligible transaction uh, separately. And so what we have in place now is we, we have agreements in place to account for about 60,000 renewable energy certificates in 2012, and what that leaves is an outstanding balance of around 90,000 uh, renewable energy certificates in order to meet the 50% commitment to light green customers as well as anticipated participation in the deep green program. And so confirmation letter number two accounts for the significant majority of that outstanding balance, around 83% of it. And, uh, and as I mentioned, that the, these re renewable energy certificates will be provided from wind generators located in the Western Interconnection. Um, the agreement anticipated here is a two-year agreement, uh, which will, in all in total, it will deliver <coughs> 75,000 uh, Greeny Energy Eligible RECs in 2012 and 200,000 Greeny Energy Eligible Certificates in 2013. And that's, of course, going to uh, kind of go hand in hand with our rollout to additional customers. And as our need steps up, uh, so will the deliveries from this agreement. Uh, the balance of the renewable energy certificates, which based on projections account for about 10,000 uh, renewable energy certificates, those would be addressed later in the year after we monitor 
um, actual participation following program expansion. So we didn't really want to fully commit at this point, leave a little bit of an open position and then deal with that as the year moves on after we better understand what participation is going to be. Uh, the, the prices here are very competitive. You actually have a, a fully executed copy of, of the existing master agreement. Uh, you can see the price there. Uh, the price now is lower, and I think that's about all the detail we can, we can provide right now. Um, and so that's a very, very positive development. So that's, that's the extension of the existing agreement for Greeny Energy Certified Renewable Energy Certificates. The, the second agreement, which is a, a new agreement, substantially similar to the existing agreement, addresses RPS eligible renewable energy certificates. And so part of the, the, the change with the new renewable portfolio standard is the allowance of unbundled renewable energy certificates to make up a certain portion of overall renewable energy deliveries. And, and there's a number of reasons for that, not the least of which are operational flexibility and also reduced compliance costs. Um, and, and, and so what this agreement here will do is it will provide us with necessary renewable energy certificate supplies from RPS eligible resources um, to reduce our overall compliance costs with the renewable portfolio standard uh, while still supporting the, the development of renewable energy resources within the Western United States. This agreement, the, the, one of the key differences here is just the addition of some, some standard terms and conditions uh, that, that are basically developed by the California Public Utilities Commission to address the more narrowly defined compliance eligible product and in particular the definition of green attributes, project eligibility, and applicable law. So that's something that, that you will see in this new agreement. What that, uh, paragraph are you looking at? Uh, let's see here. Get to that. One should be under uh, definitions for green attributes. So that's going to be on page two of the California Eligible Renewable Energy Certificate Purchase and Sale Agreement. So there's a lengthy definition that begins on the bottom of page two and continues on uh, through the midpoint of page three. Uh, that's, that's one of the key, the key changes there. Um, let's see, where are the other? That doesn't necessarily specifically get to the California certified, that, right? No, it, but, but, it, but it, does, it does address the, uh, the, the specific components of uh, the green attribute that are, that are ascribed to renewable energy certificates that are eligible, eligible to participate. In, uh, in, the, in the renewable portfolio standard. Um, let's see here, the project eligibility. Should have this flag in the I think one of, one, of the key, one of the key pieces here is, is the reference to the renewable portfolio standard itself and the fact that uh, that the renewable energy certificates that are being identified here must be eligible for the state's RPS. Okay, so basically, yeah, just to, to short circuit it. So the new uh, requirements, it, it deals with a percentage and it looks like it's it scaled over time. That's and correct. then the, uh, it, the California certified recs simply track, it's a rec for the type of energy that would otherwise be uh, eligible under the renewable portfolio. That, that's correct. As part of the okay. new renewable portfolio standard, there were three different categories of renewable energy, eligible renewable energy that were created. The first being uh, in-state right. renewable energy, so generators that are physically located within the state of California or directly connected uh, with the first point of interconnection to the state of California. Uh, the second are, are what's it, is that called? What's that called again? Tranche one or something? Category one. Category yeah, or bucket one. one. Okay. Um, bucket one. So bucket right. one, and then uh, bucket two are what what are considered to be firmed and shaped transactions. So so this is where the uh, renewable attribute and the energy itself are not necessarily uh, contemporaneously delivered. So there there can be some flexibility in using uh, energy from other resources to firm and shape 
or to basically create a, a customized product um, that uh, provides for a higher level of operational certainty. That's category or bucket two. Uh, there's a, a limited use of that. And then category or bucket three, those are the unbundled renewable energy certificates. And there's the, really the, they are the most limited in terms of use uh, within the, uh, the definition of the RPS. And so over the 2011, 12, and 13 calendar years, entities, jurisdictional entities, are allowed to procure up to 25% of their renewable energy deliveries from um, eligible um, unbundled renewable energy certificates. And so that, that's basically 5% of total retail sales. And so um, that, that's what we're looking at here is that very small portion of renewable energy from unbundled renewable energy certificates. And this, uh, this is another two-year agreement. Total delivery of renewable energy certificates under this agreement would be 53,000 uh, RECs. So 15,000 in 2012 and another 38,000 in 2013. Uh, as we've previously discussed now, this supports regulatory compliance at a reduced cost. And, uh, and then this also will, uh, will provide a bit of resource flexibility for the seller so they, they can use virtually whatever type of resource they want so long as it meets California's definition of uh, eligible renewable resources. So this could be wind, solar, uh, geothermal, any number of dis different resources and it, and it must be tagged with a, um, an RPS identification number in order to meet the eligibility requirements. So this will be a resource that's actually been certified by the um, the, uh, the, the Public Utilities Commission is meeting the, uh, the Renewable Portfolio Standard. And these, these RECs, both the Green E-Energy as well as the RPS eligible will be continue to be transferred to MEA's existing account in the Western Renewable Energy Generation Information System, which is also known as Regis. Um, so, so we'll continue to monitor um, the receipt of those, those Renewable Energy Certificates and the retirement of those certificates to demonstrate compliance. Um, with the state's standard. And uh, as I also mentioned, these come at a very competitive price with, uh, with no credit requirements imposed on MEA. So I think this is a, a really positive, um, positive set of agreements here that, uh, that again will reduce compliance costs as well as overall renewable energy costs for MCE customers and the recommendation to your board this evening is to approve both of these agreements. Director Epcon. I'm sure you said it in here, but I, I, I probably missed it. Help me out. What's the percentage of, of all the renewable energy that we have in, for MEA that is a, a REC as opposed to uh, a real electron? Uh, the, the RECs make up, at, well, right now, based on the, the decision to go to 50%, it'd be 22% it'd be of, of total deliveries. Would be for the 50 percent product 22 percent of it is, is based upon Rex well it, it yeah it, it's 22 percent of the total supply oh, the total supply so 28 percent of the supply would be from RPS eligible products 27 28 depending on actual customer participation and then 22 23 percent will be from uh, unbundled renewable energy certificates okay so is there do we have any policy or guidelines to say what percentage going forward will be Rex versus actual renewable energy. Well, I think the underlying guideline is is our need to comply with the the renewable portfolio standard itself. So of course, you know that will be our baseline um, at, a, at a minimum. Right now, we're certainly exceeding that, but that would be our baseline for uh, RPS eligible purchases, and then the balance um, would be made up. With Rex, but there is no to answer your question. Um, I don't believe that we've we put in a policy specifically in place. To the only that. reason why I asked the question, and, and maybe it isn't Kirby, maybe it's more a Don question. It's just, of course, there's a lot of discussion in the public about having too many Rex versus other types of energy to represent the red energy energy portfolio. I just, I, you know, I've heard a lot of criticism about that, and so I just want to be able to be. Conversant enough to be able to answer the question when someone asks me in this area. That's all. So, 
Yeah, and one, one of the things to keep in mind I, as well, and I, I, I'm, I hope this is helpful in, in answering your question and addressing these, these types of issues when they come up, is that every green electron that's produced comes with a rep, whether it's RPS eligible no. or not. I understand. Yeah. I understand that every single one does, but you still get a choice whether you're getting a rack or whether you're actually getting, you're buying the green, the green electron that gets put into the, into the grid. Yeah, and, and I think the, the key consideration is that it'd be very difficult to run a system entirely with intermittent renewable energy resources. Of course, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. Uh, it's very difficult to plan around those considerations. And so one of the things that is very um, kind of fundamental to the use of a renewable energy certificate is that it provides you with operational flexibility and it allows you to support green energy and all of the environmental benefits that go with that while still having a fair amount of operational flexibility so that you can reasonably meet your customers' energy requirements um, and, and do so at a, at a reasonable rate. And so that's really, that, that's where unbundled renewable energy certificates play a very key role in providing that operational flexibility um, so that you're, you're not buying more energy than you actually need um, based on the fact that the wind won't always blow and the sun won't always shine. And similarly, you won't buy less than you need and leave your customers exposed to um, the volatility in, in, the, in, in basically the real-time markets. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Director Sears. Well, the, what, the other thing I'd add to that, Kirby, if assuming I'm reading this correctly, is I understand it. Well, we're permitted to have unbundled RECs constitute up to 25% of our total portfolio, right? And so currently, uh, we're, if we're at 22%, we're actually beneath the ceiling of where we could be under the California standard. Yeah, and one of the, one of the things, um, you, just to focus in on that for a second, what, what the renewable portfolio standard allows you to do is it allows you for the years 2011, 12, and 13 to satisfy 25% of your RPS obligations, which right, so if you do the math, zero. it's 5% of your oh, total yeah, retail sales. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little less than, yeah. than you'd think, right. wh which, um, yeah, again, I think this is really the state's way of recognizing that there's a a value in providing operational flexibility, mm -hmm. but there's also similarly a value in supporting um, you know, in-state. In, in but actually, maybe projects. just to nail that down. Yeah. So of our RPS eligible, what percent, in terms of the way we meet our RPS standard, what percent is RAC? We can go no, we can go no higher than 5% than of our, our total retail sales. So even though we're now exceeding the 20% target, we're not allowed to go above that 5% in, in reporting um, to the Public Utilities Commission on how it is that we meet the RPS. So that, that percentage doesn't, doesn't increase even when you go above the 20%. Um, we're still limited to, to, you know, the depending on how you do the math, 25% of, of the 20% obligation or 5% of the total. Yeah. Right. That, that limit still right. applies. So we can't scale it up as we go above and beyond um, the, the, the RPS that's currently effective. We, we, we just can't do that, we're limited that way. It, yeah, it, it does, it ratchets down. So between 20, 2014 and, uh, is it 2016 or 17? So you have a three year window, 2014, 15, and 16, that 25% rec usage goes down to 15%. And then 2017 to 2020, it drops down to 10%. So they're phasing that out over time. And the idea there is that you need to give developers sufficient lead time in order to develop in-state projects. And folks like MEA and other entities will be actively engaged in contracting efforts in order to support these in-state and regional projects. And so we're, we're going to give some operational flexibility in the interim while those projects come online and then scale the use of, of renewable energy certificates the unbundled certificates, that is, um, down to a really a, a de minimis level. Director okay. Wachtel. Is there a geographic function to these RECs? Is, is a REC that is created, let's say, in New Zealand the same as one that would be created in Washington? 
Uh, no, as a matter of fact, uh, they're not. And, and so one of the things, um, say, take the, the Greeny Energy uh, recs, for example, that we, that we contract with. All of those recs need to be produced by generators located effectively within the western United States. Or the so there is a geographic? Region. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and one of the things that your board approved was the, the uh, Greeny Energy certification of our Deep Green product. And one of the things that comes with that is, is a really, you know, more narrowly defined geographic region from which you can use these, these recs. And so absolutely, yeah, there's a difference. Thanks. So even our non-RPS are green on the recs. Because I, in a way that responds a little to what, what Led was getting to, is if we're buying clean energy equivalents that were created in New Zealand, it's not quite the same as buying them if they're created locally, it's, the effect on the environment is different as it pertains to us. So I think that that's a... Yeah. 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 How about Canada? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, you know, the, I think the, uh, the Western Interconnection uh, does include portions of, 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 you know, Canada as well as portions of Mexico, but um, what we're looking at here is, is you know, for the Greeny Energy Certified Recs, these are typically going to be wind resources located within the Pacific Northwest. Well, the only reason why I mentioned is I just happened to have been in Canada last week, as you can see by my beard, <laughs> and uh, and there was all these ads for wind power in every magazine that I opened mm -hmm. up in Canada. So yeah. if you want to go find some renewable energy, it's in Canada. Yeah, there's a lot of it there. <laughs> <laughs> Director Green. Okay, I, I want to see um, if if conceptually and, and practically my grasp of, of the role that Rex plays or play in, in our portfolio is, is correct and hopefully uh, without tying myself up in, in knots in the process of <laughs> trying to do so. So a renewable energy certificate is a value that's produced at the same time actual green energy is, is produced. And so it's, a, it's basically a paper value. Uh, and because it's a paper value, uh, there are some green energy vanguard advocates like Larry Fawn, who has been critical, uh, saying, what are you doing putting a lot of your eggs <coughs> in wrecks instead of, of green energy. And so with us, in terms of our need now to purchase renewable energy certificates, is in part the operational flexibility values that you discussed, but it's also to meet our policy decision to have our light green product be 50% renewable <coughs> energy to meet that uh, that policy objective and goal and, and promise too. Right, so far yeah. I'm on track? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. As well as provide, <coughs> excuse me, a, a deep green product. As, as well as, as, as to provide that. And I, <laughs> so if I, if I understand it right, the renewable portfolio standard is a state law applied limit that is aimed at reducing the extent of the play that renewable energy certificates have in the market over time. Is that a fair interpretation? Yeah, I, I believe that's that's right. I think I caught all that right. Yeah. Okay, so so then that, that's so so that's good because the the. RPS or renewable portfolio standard, that's the mechanism that the state government is employing and to which we are adhering that over time meets and addresses the criticism that RECs are all paper only and not a real, as it were, uh, part of the solution because RECs don't directly involve the production of, of green energy. Um, so, so far do I have the overall concepts and practical applications accurately stated? 
Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I think well, we're except, that, except for yeah, I was yeah, going to. I, 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 I was going to. It does involve the production yeah. of green energy. No, it does. Yeah. You had, he was emphasizing. The, no, I understand. Yeah. He, he was emphasizing the first part, not the second part. Right. Yeah. Had, exactly. No, I understand that you that without the production of green energy, you don't get a wreck. Right. Yeah. You don't. You're rec, not directly wrecks, you don't print up wrecks like that. some governments print up money. Right. Yeah. So you, you got to produce in order to get a wreck, uh, but but the, yeah. the 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 wrecks are aside from and are a value that we use in the in the economics of of green energy that some people are critical about and are saying, well, it's really mm -hmm. kind of a phony deal because it's paper. It's, you're not getting to the goal of producing green energy fast enough. And my what my point is is the application of the renewable portfolio standard is a built-in governmental requirement that over time gets us to the same goal. It just doesn't try to do it all at once because it's impossible to, to do it all at once. And so I just wanted to make sure that trying to translate all of this stuff into semi-understandable English that, that I'm able to do that. See, yeah, or, it, or it's also my and stop. Well, I just hold hold on. Um, can I, I just want to because Kirby's the guy I trust on this, and the and is the guy I'm looking to because he's the one that I that that knows the most about it and that I've communicated with before. So I've got a point of reference with him okay. that I want to keep. Okay. Yeah. But let me just add. yeah. Also, there's in the creation of this green energy there there are situations where. The party that creates the green energy actually uses the energy, mm -hmm. but doesn't because it sells the wreck. It doesn't get credit for using clean energy. It, in fact, by definition, is using dirty energy now <clears throat> because it has sold the cleanness to somebody else. So, if they wanted to sell the energy, they'd have to sell it as though it were not clean energy because they've already stripped out the clean energy from it. The clean energy equivalent, but many of these places that make the energy use it, so it doesn't really make a difference to them whether it's clean or not because they're not selling it. Thank you. Yeah, and a couple, couple of things to, like to think about here. You know, one, one is the simple idea that for every megawatt hour of renewable energy that's produced, and of course the related wreck that comes with right. it, that means one less megawatt hour of fossil fuel generation is required. Correct. And so there's kind of a temporal issue here, right? So it takes time to develop projects. This right. is a long-term process we're a part of here. And, uh, and and it's also a global issue. So to support right. wind resources in the Pacific <coughs> Northwest, um, it, that, that's still a positive, positive thing to do. Um, and a lot of the criticism that, that comes from, you know, regarding the use of, of RECs, um, typically anyway, what I found is from proponents of uh, substantially distributed uh, generation networks. So solar on your rooftop, neighborhood solar farms, things like that. And I think one of the things that MEA is doing, they are supporting all those programs. They have a very aggressive uh, net energy metering tariff. They, we also have a feed-in tariff. Um, to support the development of local renewable energy projects, but those things take time, right. particularly here, you know, in, in Marin. So one of the things that renewable energy certificates allows you to do, it's 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 kind of a zero to sixty in zero <coughs> seconds, where you can um, you can participate in this market and go from from nothing to something overnight, still provide a lot of support financially to renewable energy resources and the developers of those resources. And, and claim credit for that environmental benefit that's being created. And so, um, you know, I, I think one of the, the things that proponents of distributed generating networks need to keep in mind is that, you know, these things, they do, they take time. And, and we're, we're on a very long road here. We're at the very beginning of that road. And we're going to continue uh, to implement policy to support the movement towards, you know, that end goal, but in the interim, this provides us with uh, with a lot of flexibility in how it is that we get there. Right, and so using that same metaphor, going from zero to sixty, uh, in order to, to be able to move fast and have 
operational flexibility now, what the restrictions of the renewable portfolio standards are that require bringing the percentage of RECs down and align them more with the actual production of energy is over the long run to, to, to bring the focus of the whole program to, the, to a greater percentage of production of actual green energy, right? In state. Yeah. In the state. In state. Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. you tag that on and absolutely I agree. And Kirby, eventually the RECs will be phased out, is that correct? Well, or under the current RPS, to. they go down to, to tip, you know, a maximum of 10%. Right. So, very low. Okay. And then what happens after 2020 is really yet to be determined. So, right. but yeah, they do get down to a pretty okay. low level. Yeah. Thank you. When I think in addition to, to the requirements moving in that direction, I think it's also important to underscore, as Kirby said, our own policy directives mm -hmm. are moving us toward distributed right. energy as well. Right. So, I mean, yeah. that's really the ultimate goal. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think in the, in the interim, um, resource diversity is a, is a very good thing. Uh, and so well, I think it's essential. it's essential and that's one of the things that we're trying to be mindful of as we move forward in our resource planning efforts is not only supporting these distributed projects both on local residents and, and, and businesses um, you know, as well as kind of small utility scale projects through our feed-in tariff but also these bigger projects and, and regional projects that are really essential to a, a diverse supply portfolio so yeah, absolutely. You know, just, just one more thing if I can tag on it. It's also, it's also a rate issue. Uh, you know, the RECs are quite a bit less, exp more uh, cheaper than the projects that we've done for, you know, bundled energy deals and a long-term PPA with a new resource. REC is substantially cheaper than that. So, you know, we're trying to balance um, the, the cost of providing the green power, the pace at which we can develop new you know, physical assets, uh, considering our our, uh, our size, our credit standing, um, you know, and, and the, the pace at which we can enter into new long-term power purchase agreements, um, and and the overall rate structure, you know, we just talked about rates and a lot of concern how we compare to PG&E. So, right. you know, that's another argument of why we're we're right. using RECs right. for our non-RPS to get to the 50 percent from the 27 percent RPS. Right. We're using the RECs for the balance of that right. as our RPS increases over time. The amount of RECs that we um, would procure will reduce over time, and as we develop new projects over time, uh, we should be displacing some of the REC purchases yeah. as well. Anything else on this side? Okay, great discussion. Okay. Yes, Gene. Yes. Come on up to the mic. I'm still confused as I seem to always be about the price issue. Are these people being asked to sign a blank check or when will the price information be available? Can I yeah. go ahead and answer? Yeah, the, if, you, if you notice, uh, Mr. Dyer, the, uh, the, the pricing for our previously executed agreement mm -hmm. with, is, is actually provided in the board packet now. Oh, I'm sorry, I, did, I missed that. Yeah, and, and, and after approval, if that happens this evening, pricing will also be available for the, uh, that are, for the agreements that are being considered this evening. Uh, will those then be placed on the website along with the other uh, related documents? Yeah, actually, we have um, so many contracts now that it, it's become a little cumbersome to have all of them on the website, but they're provided upon request. Okay. Anyone else in the public? Okay, I'd ask for a motion for approval of confirmation letter number two. Mm -hmm. I know, I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed? That matter carries. Um, and then also a uh, motion for approval of the California Eligible Renewable Energy Certificate Purchase and Sale Agreement. I'll move that. So I'll second that. Is that correct, Don? I'm sorry, are you, are you still on <coughs> item 9? Mm -hmm. yes. Have you moved on yes. to item 10? No, we're on 9. nine. Okay, just making sure that I'm, that is correct. So that's the second agreement, That's the correct? second agreement. Okay, we have a motion and second on that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Opposed? That matter carries. Okay, so should we move on then? 
into uh, Yeah, so um, item 10. Yeah, what do you guys? Excuse me, we have a concern. My apologies. Um, I, if we could, I'd like to have the motion redone and to clarify that it would be the California Eligible Renewable Energy Certificate Purchase and Sale Agreement with One Energy along with the uh, confirmation letter number one attached there too. Ah, okay. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Yes. Thank you. That matter carries. We'd like to know what we actually did. Okay, item 10, California Energy Eligible Renewable Energy Certificate Purchase and Sale Agreement with Middle Fork Irrigation District. Yep. Okay, well, um, as, as previously noted, this is really uh, what amounts to an extension of uh, some of the discussion that we've already had now. For the, uh, for the 2012 calendar year, um, according to, to the Renewable Portfolio Standard, we would be able to procure and deliver to our customers 25% of our renewable energy from unbundled renewable energy certificates. And so one of the, the agreements that you just approved will provide for 15,000 of the 35,000 renewable energy certificates uh, that we'll need in, in 2012. Uh, this agreement that you'll be considering right now with the Middle Fork Irrigation District will provide uh, the balance of that open position for 2012, so the balance of the California RPS eligible renewable energy certificates uh, for 2012. And uh, again, this is, a, this is another agreement here that's, uh, that will reduce overall compliance costs with the Renewable Portfolio Standard. John just mentioned uh, what an important consideration that is as uh, we move forward and, and address our renewable energy needs. And, uh, and that this agreement is really, it's identical um, to the California Eligible Renewable Energy Certificate Purchase and Sale Agreement that you just approved, right. um, accepting the, uh, the, the terms of the confirmation that the, and the confirmation itself. Um, this agreement is also, it's already been approved by the Middle Fork Irrigation District's board, so that's another nice thing. We wouldn't be waiting on anybody else to, uh, to approve this if your board chooses to move forward with this agreement this evening. Uh, one of the things I'd want to do right now is just provide you with a little bit of information about the Middle Fork Irrigation District. It is kind of a neat organization, and I think this is a, a pretty unique opportunity for us uh, to do business with, uh, with another municipal entity. Uh, located in the Hood River Valley in Oregon. And so, the, a little bit here about the MFID, as uh, the acronym is. They were formed in 1921 for the purpose of delivering irrigation to local farmers, and specifically orchard lands, 6,400 acres um, of family-owned orchards in the Hood River Valley. Uh, the revenues for this district are derived from user <coughs> fees and power generation revenues and the agency is governed by five representatives from local family farms. Uh, the network of hydroelectric generation that would be supplying the renewable energy certificates to us through this agreement uh, is a network of, of off-river hydroelectric generation facilities that became operational in 1986 uh, and are capable of producing about 25,000 megawatt hours annually of renewable energy. There's three small generators in total and, and an aggregate 3.3 megawatts of capacity. So this is truly small hydroelectric power, um, kind of a, a cool network of projects for lack of a better expression uh, that they have. And, and MFID's primary focus among, uh, among other things, including the supply of water to their, their customers, is a, a focus on watershed health and including improved fisheries and, and related habitat um, and in general riparian health. So they also received a, 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 an award recently, the Friends of the Fisheries Award by the Mount Hood Forest Service. And, uh, and so I think this is uh, really a, a kind of a, a local organization with interests that are um, in, in substantial part aligned with those of, of this agency. And so this is a neat opportunity that we have uh, to support a, an organization with similar focus. And, uh, and, and do so by buying something that, uh, that we all want and need, which is uh, more renewable energy. So that's, uh, that's the agreement that we're looking at this evening, and staff's recommendation is that you uh, approve that. Thank you. 
Kirby. Yes, Director Rick. So, is there in these unbundled recs, Kirby? In these unbundled recs, is there? Are we competing with the other IOUs? Or what, I got the independent, the, the other like PG&E and this, Are they all out hunting for these unbundled recs too? And 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 so we're there's like a, a competitive market now, and, and we're bidding against these other folks. Yeah, that that's actually it's it's, it's an evolving market. Um, I think you know with the the RPS changes coming into into effect relatively uh, recently, uh, this is something where you know we're kind of observing increased competition for these types of products and one of the things that we found in the past and that I think we continue to find now is that uh, because of our size and the fact that we're you know we make up such a small portion of, of PG&E's uh, service territory we're in a position to be able to do business with, uh, with, a, with entities on a much smaller scale uh, such as this and so um, I think what we're up against in terms of competition for these types of, of opportunities is, is maybe a little bit different than what the uh, investor-owned utilities are experiencing. But yeah, there is competition out there now, and, uh, and we're kind of starting to see convergence on a, on a particular price for these types of uh, products, which is, which is neat, so. And so the next question is, I know you guys are, uh, smart guys figuring out with the crystal ball what to do with all this. And I see that we need, <coughs> what, another 20,000 recs we anticipate is our need for this year, if I, if I read correctly, is that right? This, this agreement with the Middle Fork Irrigation District would satisfy that need. Okay, so, so this satisfies the rest of the needs for 2012. That, that's correct. So, so this would be intended to meet the entirety of our uh, obligations or allowances under the RPS for this. And are we looking at longer term so we have option rights or something going out for 2013, 14, 15 on these recs so that we... Y yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, just, just like the, the previous two agreements. This is a this is a two year agreement. We are looking beyond that. Um, you know, you mentioned options. The, these these are uh, referenced in unsolicited proposals that we regularly receive, and we're also um, in regular contact with brokers of renewable energy certificates and various environmental products, and trying to keep an eye on the ball as we move forward. And, um, you know, but with, with cost and rate constraints in mind. What, what we've seen so far is that these shorter term agreements really provide um, the lowest cost, best value to our customers. And so moving forward with something like this is very responsible. And of course, we'll continue to keep our eye on the ball for, for the out years, if you will. Thank you. Well, and of course, overall, we're going to be you know, engaging in uh, integrated resource planning uh, yes. as we already are but that's even going to be heightened in the next several years as uh, we uh, come up against 2015 with the shell contract expiring, et cetera, so. Yeah, and we'll, be, we'll also be dealing with, you know, potential variability in development schedules uh, for some of the resources that we've entered into contracts with, and so absolutely, I mean, that's a, an effort that continue to, uh, to be actively engaged in make adjustments as necessary. I have another question. Since I heard Kirby tout the fact that the uh, uh, environmental uh, benefits of, of MFID are, are, really, are really great, I happened to read in the IJ, maybe it was today or yesterday, where, of course, the MEA is being uh, uh, criticized for its long-term shell contract, and so is that, again, is that a, a policy that we have that's been adopted where we consider the environmental bona fides of the organization when we, when we go to look for power? Is that something that's considered? Yeah, as a matter of fact, that was a, a specific criteria that was folded into a, a previous RFP for renewable energy. Um, it's a criteria that's showing up again as we evaluate the proposals that we've received in response to the open season. And uh, absolutely, we, we ask for information about uh, the sustainability practices and, and other environmental concerns of the organizations um, that we may do business with, and those prospective <coughs> counterparties provide us with that. And um, you know, to the extent that uh, those interests and, and, and projects are aligned with with our own, um, they score more favorably in those categories. So. Great, thank you. Kirk, as a follow-up to Len's question, do we have any idea how much energy PG&E purchases from Cena, if any? You know, that, that would be uh, 
that's a good question. I, I don't know specifically what the quantity um, is, is there. I, I know that the, you know, really the, the majority of their clients are municipal utilities, mm -hmm. um, you know, here in California. Well, uh, if in fact they purchase a substantial amount from Cena, then that would sort of blow that criticism out of the water, obviously. We are uh, aware of a, a purchase that occurred in 2010 yeah. between um, Shell Energy North America and PG&E. Um, mm -hmm. PG&E did purchase power from them. Um, so we know we know of, you know a, a few, but um, I I don't think you know some of that information is confidential, right. and we certainly don't have a, a quantity number on that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Other directors, Director Green. Uh, with respect to um, the uh, hood. Uh, River Valley uh, Middle Fork Irrigation District. Uh, your description of them kind of brings like Jimmy Stewart's "It's a Wonderful Life" to MEA. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. How did you find them? <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we, as Kirby mentioned, we are in touch with a number of brokers of renewable energy certificates, and um, we we had a, a number of offers that came in at the price range that that we were hoping for, and. Um, we looked at them, and, you know, kind of compared who they were, what the what the story was, the history, and this one did look like a particularly good fit for MEA's goals, um, given the the family farm connection, um, the you know the local agency. They have um, board meetings just like we do. Of you know, that's a public agency, and um, they the other thing that I that really stood out to me is is their goals around uh, water protection and um, and uh, using. Using the the revenue coming in from the Rex is going to enable them to, you know, help with frost control on their fruit trees and, um, you know, making sure they have enough fish ladders in place for the fish and, and stuff like that. That I think are are is really aligned with our both our board and our community. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great choice and it, it's, it's nice value to be able to support them. Okay. I, I happen to be familiar with this area because my brother and his family live close by, and as you know, it's all apple and pear orchards. I just think it's fantastic that we're <laughs> able to enter into this agreement with such a good organization. It's, it's a really a wonderful community that does share a lot of our values. So, um, cheers to you for finding them. Yeah. Yeah. We're very lucky. Yeah. And I think Beth has a comment to add to the um, motion. <laughs> I can't yeah, stop it. I can't help but be stuff comes um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, So when you approve the California Ener California Eligible Renewable Energy Certificate Purchase and Sale Agreement with the Middle Fork Irrigation District, that should um, also include confirmation letter number one attached there too. Okay, great. Do you so, have any more comment on this side? Sure yourself. Any members of the public? Okay, so uh, do I have a motion? I'll move move what Beth just said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever she said. <laughs> well, you come on, you got to say confirmation letter number one as part of it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. I'll second. Okay. Well, she said attached there too. <laughs> Whoa, we have a defect. Exactly. Um, okay, we have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, yes. I oppose. I better care. So they say yes in San Antonio. I'm the only one. You'll, By the way, I mean, what's our uh, time frame on the open season? Okay, I'll say yes. Like yeah, yeah uh, right now we're uh, finishing up our preliminary evaluation, and uh, and so we'll kind of be circling up internally as, as staff and, and, uh, and kind of preparing a rank order of, uh, okay. of respondents here. I, I would say with really within the next week, and oh, then, uh, you know this 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 will move forward pretty quickly at, at that point. And, some discussion about. Yeah, we're looking at having an ad hoc contracts committee meeting in uh, early next month uh, to look at to look at the uh, the top um, candidates and uh, develop a short list. Great, thanks. Okay, item eleven, we're actually pulling from the agenda, so. Yeah, okay. no, this, this, is, this item is fine. Okay, item 11, officer certification and policy 005. Okay, this, this item relates to a new requirement um, coming out of the California Independent System Operator, CAISO. 
and uh, it applies to MEA as a market participant. And um, it's really the result of, uh, it relates to the credit requirements, and it's, it's really a, a, pretty much a fallout from the financial crisis. And um, there are some speculation in some of the energy markets in the northeastern United States that um, resulted in some defaults, uh, particularly um, you know, firms like Lehman Brothers and some of the other uh, financial players were, were speculating in a particular uh, financial instrument that is called uh, uh, fixed transmission uh, rights um, in the Northeast markets. And so the Federal Energy Regu Regulatory Commission, which you know, regulates these organized markets like CAISO, and there are several of them throughout the United States, uh, issued Order 741. And uh, Order 741 addresses uh, credit reform in these organized markets. and. It is, uh, require certain minimum, minimum participation standards. And so the uh, CAISO has uh, recently enacted their minimum participation standards, and that's what, uh, that's what this item is all about. So uh, <coughs> the, what the CAISO is requiring is an annual officer certification uh, from MEA and, and any other market participant for that matter. Um, that essentially certifies compliance with the CAISO's tariff uh, rules and business practices with regards to credit management. And part of that is um, also having documented risk management uh, policies and controls for CAISO market transactions. So that's the, the introduction to this. And where that the hook is into MEA, in effect, you know, as you're aware, uh, MEA does not really directly participate in CAISO markets. It's, it's all at this point done through CENA. And CENA is financially responsible to the CAISO for transactions that are, are done on MEA's behalf. Um, in fact, when this first came up, we were uh, a little bit puzzled and had numerous conference calls with the CAISO to explain the situation. Um, but where it does apply is uh, MEA is a CRR <coughs> holder. So MEA has an agreement with the CAISO that we executed back in April 2010. And what the, that CRR agreement allows is it, is it gives or it uh, provides MEA an allocation of valuable congestion revenue rights. And these are, um, these are uh, basically what these are, they, they allow MEA to hedge their and reduce their transmission congestion costs. Um, so, and, and I'll get into that, explain exactly what a CRR is in a moment. But, you know, the way things are set up with CENA, CENA really manages our CRRs for us, um, but the CRRs in our, in, are in our name. They're in MEA's name through this contract with the CAISO. And that's why, um, that's why we have to meet the minimum, minimum participation standards. So if we go to the next slide, you know, what is a congestion revenue, right? The CRR, it's a financial instrument um, that essentially it enables a load serving entity to offset their congestion costs. So what it does is um, when we use the transmission system, when we schedule our energy, or CENA does it for us, but we schedule the energy um, on, the, on the CAISO transmission system, you know, we're basically scheduling energy from point A, which is where the energy is produced, to point B, which is where we take it out on the grid. Um, and there can, if there is you know, too, mu too much power attempting to be scheduled along that path, then what happens is the price at point A is lower than the price at point B, so we're charged the difference as congestion. That's just the way that the basic power scheduling works with the, under the CAISO regime. Um, so what a CRR does is it, if you have a CRR from point A to point B and there's congestion from point A to point B, then the CAISO pays you. It, 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 um, a CRR holder will receive a payment for congestion along that path. So an entity like MEA that is both scheduling along that path and holds a CRR along that path effectively um, eliminates its congestion costs. And that's why CRRs are of value, and that's why MEA participates and, and receives an allocation of CRRs um, from the CAISO. Now, so that's an example of hedging, and that's, that is, and this is what our policy number five, which is 
um, recommended for adoption this evening very clearly specifies that that is the sole purpose that MEA uses CRRs for is hedging its congestion costs. There's another use which is essentially speculation. So an entity could purchase a CRR and not schedule energy along that path and just be looking to receive the congestion payment associated with holding the CRR. Um, the problem with that or the risk with, with that sort of speculation is that the congestion could go the other way and a CRR can become a liability. And what could happen is if you hold the CRR and the congestion reverses, you actually have to pay the CAISO. Okay? What, what's reverse congestion? That means that rather than there being congestion from point A to point B, there's congestion from point B to point A. So the price at point B is lower than the price at point A. That's, we've got this little simple diagram here. Right here, price at point A is $20 a megawatt hour, at B is $22 a megawatt hour. So that means that there's uh, more power trying to go from A to B, and there's congestion, and that's worth $2. It's possible, th there's a chance that that could flip, and the price at point B could be lower than the price at point A. In that case, then, if you had a CRR on A to B, you would have to pay. If you're, like I said, if you're scheduling from A to B, it doesn't matter, because um, if we're scheduling from A to B and the prices reverse, that means that our congestion costs would be negative, the CAISO, but then our CRR would require us to pay the CAISO, and so again, those, those would net out. That's why it's a, it's a hedging instrument. It's the it's exact reverse of our congestion costs, so as long as we're scheduling on the path that we hold a CRR on, um, our congestion costs are essentially zero. So I'm trying to distinguish this from, from um, other market participants or participants who might use these as essentially investments or speculative um, financial instruments. Okay, so uh, the way that we use it, and that's, again, that's what the policy 005 specifies, is we only use these to hedge our congestion costs, um, not for speculative purposes. Okay? We're very happy to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's good. Is there a, a reverse hedging mechanism? So, so if you run the risk of, of getting uh, hit with a reverse you congestion, you yeah, you want, you want, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. You can you hedge it. against that? Can, is, is there a, <laughs> is, because I mean, it, it's very similar to the, commo the commodities market. I mean, not what it is. But, I, I mean, it's a, it's a serious question um, whether or not there's a, a hedging mechanism uh, whether there's just the choice to be able to use one that goes in the in the other direction. So if you're if, if we are at risk with getting hit with liability for reverse congestion, uh, whether we can hedge against that or whether it's just a one way deal. Well, if you hedge against the hedge, you're sure. okay, guys. Right. So we're a right. So what? Agency. We're not we're not speculating. Well, nobody's talking about speculating. <laughs> he says, can you hedge both ways? So for, well, yeah. I mean. What what happens? Okay, in the example that that you just raised, if there um, is congestion now from B to A instead of A to B, and we hold the CRR from A to B, okay. we would have to pay the CAISO as because of our CRR holding. Right. But since we're scheduling from A to B, we receive a credit of uh, essentially we we have negative congestion costs from A to B. So that's why it's a natural, it's a hedge. That's why as long as you're scheduling along the path that you hold the CRR. You're, there's no risk. So there's no exposure. There's no exposure. It's, there's only risk or exposure if you're not scheduling energy. You're not actually using the transmission system that you hold the CRR on. I see. So, so in other words, if, if, if you're lined up to go and, and move energy and for whatever reason decide not to, uh, then it's, it's the not using that schedule that puts you um, at risk for I don't know if the right language is eating your CRR, but, um, it, it, but you're right. then, then you're subject to whatever the value of the CRR is. And, you know, it, the CRRs that we have have always been positive value. Okay. Because what we, you know, we've scheduled from our hydro facility or the resource that we've had during a contract from Donnell's. We have CRRs from there, essentially, to, to our MEA takeout point. And then also um, from the NP15 hub, which is not really a location, but it's an aggregation of points. We have CRRs from, um, from that hub to our takeout point. And you know, we monitor these on a regular basis, 
uh, every month we look at it and, and every month we've received uh, a credit as a result of our CRR. Um, but we're also scheduling there. So, you know, that credit is simply offsetting congestion costs that we pay. Right. Um, but you're right, if there's a mismatch, if you're not um, scheduling uh, equivalent to the CRR holding, uh, then, then, you, then you would be exposed to whatever CRR settlement yeah. that, you know, would who, result from that. Who sells so, things? Who sells the CAISO? They sell both ways. CAISO administers the market, and then there's bilateral trades that can take place. We don't do any of that. We just get an allocation, as it, because the, these are these were originally granted to PG&E in our case, because they're they're a good thing to have when you're scheduling yeah. energy, uh, and as a result of the load, you know, migrating over to MEA, we are uh, entitled to an allocation of CRRs, and that's. That's the only process that we participate in. Uh, there's other, there's auctions and there's bilateral trading. We don't do any of that. <clears throat> Next slide, yeah. Okay, so the, the um, officer certification, I, I described that briefly and that's attached to the, to the it's, a, it's in your board packet, a draft response. But that's just a standard CAISO form and it essentially explains how we meet the CAISO's requirements. Um, so it talks about training uh, requirements for our, any of our employees or agents who are transacting in the CAISO markets. Um, it um, specifies we, have, uh, we maintain written risk management policies and controls, which of course is what policy 005 is intended to fulfill, uh, that we have the ability to value our CRR holdings uh, and that our um, we have an independent validation that, that our validation of the holdings is separate from the people who are actually entering into the CRR transactions. In our case, it's Cena who's entering into the CRR transactions for us, and we are independently uh, monitoring those. Um, that we have uh, controls and limits to the positions, and here our limit is we will not uh, acquire CRRs that go beyond our scheduling need. So again, that hedging purpose. And, uh, and then finally, that we have documentation to any exceptions to our risk management policy. So that's the officer certification. Again, that's the standard CAISO form. And then the new policy 005 is really, uh, it documents our current risk management practices and meets the CAISO's requirements. Um, it's relatively brief because it's, it's really appropriate for MEA's current um, <coughs> level of participation in the markets. Uh, since Cena is really doing the bulk of transacting in the CAISO markets on our behalf, and they have their own risk management policies, they have their own uh, credit posting that they're providing, we're really only um, dealing with our CRR holdings, and that's a very uh, limited uh, level of participation. So over time, if we were to start pulling in-house some of the stuff that Cena is doing for us, this we'd expect this policy to be expanded and updated to be for a more sophisticated uh, level of involvement, for a more intense level of involvement. So basically, at this point, Don is certifying that the CNA personnel have been have been meet all, have met all the CAISO required training, for instance. Um, we I mean, do we that we have that? risk management practices? How are no, we no, no, How no. are we certifying what I, what they're doing? How do we have that information that we can certify what somebody else is doing? The, well, really, what we're um, certify we're we're using the certification to explain what Cena is doing and then what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if we look at the the policy, for instance, you know, we have a policy that employees, contractors, and agents transacting the CAISO markets have to meet the um, the CAISO training requirements. We, we receive certificates from Kaiso. To, to, to we get evidence of that so that she has all the stack of paper and she goes through and says, okay, now I'm going to certify. In, in, I'm sorry, in regards to? Well, well, for her to certify somebody else's training, she's, she's either got to be there and watch it or she's got to get a certificate. Yeah, we're looking at number one, John. So this is under officer certification form, number one. Number one? Yeah.
Okay, so the, the question really is um, how can we certify that SENA staff have the appropriate training? Correct. Right. That's okay. what this is saying. Right. So we can, we can certainly certify that our own folks who aren't actually engaging these tra transactions would have the training. They, yeah. There is a registration requirement for all kind of trainees, and so this is, this is something that we, we can certainly request from, from the, the ISO and or SENA. Does See. CENA fill out one of these certification forms itself? They did, and they, they already have. So shouldn't we, shouldn't we direct their attention to the form that CENA has filled out on its own behalf? And we can, make a, we can make a statement about our own employees, but I don't think we should be making a statement about what um, CENA's employees are doing, and I don't think we have any responsibility to ask them for information if they're certifying themselves. Yeah, so you actually uh, pointed out one where we, we were in discussion with Tyso about whether it would make sense for us to initial on this one or reference shall. You'll notice on some of the responses um, further on down, like in item three and then. Right. I like those responses better. We are referencing, <laughs> they are referencing shall. Um, but, uh, so this is one where we're actually still pinning down what's the best response there. Um, I think you're making a good point. But if, if we were to initial this, it would be um, with the with our interpretation being that we're only making representations that our own staff is, have um, received the appropriate training um, because we're not uh, engaged in market transactions. Um, there, there's not a, a training that's required of our staff per se. So this is one that we're looking at a little more closely. Right, but if, but if we do that, we need to explain it. If that's our understanding, we need to explain it explicitly, which may be what you meant and what you just said. but. I want to make it absolutely explicit what we're initialing. Yeah, and we do yeah. have the ability to add some text here. So Perfect. Add some Perfect. Text. That'd be great. No, I, I agree. It, yeah. it, it should be explicit yeah. so yeah. that we're not yeah. on the hook for being responsible for some function we can't fulfill. Exactly. Well, and, and furthermore, you don't want to specify that you've received training if you <laughs> haven't because you haven't had yeah. that yet. Right. 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 Okay, yep. <laughs> That's a... Uh, Great suggestion. We will we'll make a change there to add some text to just explain, you know, clarify the the situation there. Are there any other questions on the um, certification itself before we move on to the policy O five? No. Okay. So as I mentioned, then um, you know this is a relatively brief policy, really. Uh, explains that uh, the only uh, market transactions we enter into currently are for CRRs, uh, is a C or is it, we, is MEA is it participates in the Kaiso market as a CRR holder. Um, and then we explain the, the nature of the risk associated with the CRR. Um, uh, we specify that they're exclusively used for hedging congestion costs. Um, and we describe the limits, the position limits on the CRRs that are consistent with that use. Uh, and we also explain the role of SENA uh, as our scheduling coordinator in um, effectively managing on an operational basis our CRR transactions. And then we describe the, the oversight that, that MEA provides to that process. Um, training, we, we simply state that um, any of our employees or contractors that are engaging in these uh, in the Kaiso markets need to have been appropriately trained. Uh, and then the final section in regards to monitoring and reporting describes the monitoring that we do on our CRR holdings, which is currently monthly, and our process for reporting those values throughout the organization, um, which is presently uh, information reporting that's provided to the, to the executive director as, as well as to um, our controller. So the recommendation here is to adopt the policy. Um, we'll make some changes to the certification form. We're not necessarily asking for approval of that document, but we are asking for approval of the policy. Okay, so uh, limiting our discussion to the policy, do I have any questions or further comments at this point? Looks pretty straightforward. Public? Okay, great. I have a motion for approval of policy oh, 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 005. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. yes. Opposed? That may be fair. Item 12, regular. 
，真的。对。對<笑> okay, it's it's like dessert, you know, the regulatory <笑> update, everybody's favorite. Um, and as a special treat this month, uh, we've included our one of our key filings for the past month, um, which clocks in at about 70 pages, but it, it really is worth the read. Um, I'm going to mostly address that in um, in my in the slides today. Um, you've seen a similar slide to this before. Um, this is this is essentially summarizing, you know, the concepts that are contained in Senate Bill uh, 790, which was passed this past year. Uh, and there's a new rulemaking that came out at the commission that is going to be addressing issues related to SB 790. And so when this idea of creating a play fair playing field, preventing cross-subsidization, and ensuring CCA autonomy, these are all recurring themes throughout SB 790. Um, and one thing that I think you might find helpful is in Exhibit B to the um, attached filing, there is a uh, a comparison of the, the changes that were made by uh, SB 790 to the laws that then existed. So, it, you know, it's for your reference, but I think that you'll, you'll find it useful in conceptualizing, you know, what the legislature is requiring of the commission and of investor-owned utilities and, and sort of the CCA framework generally. And so, going on to the next slide. Um, when we're thinking about these three sort of overlapping considerations, there are certain components within the legislation that where this is addressed, and some of this is the code of conduct. There's an expedited complaint process for uh, violations of the code of conduct. There's a requirement for the commission to facilitate the development of CCAs. Uh, in the second sort of category is the prevention of cross-subsidization, and that's the term used in the in the legislation. And so this is the idea of cost shifting and preventing that cost shifting. Uh, the requirement that any resource adequacy purchased on our behalf, and this is called the cost allocation mechanism or CAM, uh, that those resource adequacy um, purchases on our behalf have to meet a system or local reliability need. And furthermore, that that calculation has to be fair and equitable to our customers. In addition, we have to ensure that exit fees are fair. And one of the last components which comes up with regularity in here is that um, CCAs are solely responsible for their generation procurement. And so this also sort of relates to cost shifting. It also relates to just jurisdictional matters. Um, and so, you know, well, why do we need SB 790 in the first place? And how are we approaching uh, this proceeding? If you go on to the next slide. Um, you know, in, in the past year, you know, I would say, well, two years ago, right when we were launching, we faced a lot of opposition from PG&E. Um, there were significant amounts spent and um, significant troubles that related to marketing that PG&E had paid for. Um, and when you're thinking about a small CCA launching, you know, this is at the when we launched, this is our first fiscal year of operations. We were $14 million in revenues in one year. Um, so this is to scale of, you know, PG&E 2010 and MEA fiscal year 2010-2011. So PG&E is 1,000 times larger than us at launch. And when you think about the cost that were spent against our launch, um, you know, 4.3 million plus another 45 million, you know, the, the, the numbers just don't line up with regards to having a fair playing field for the launch of CCAs. Um, and so a lot of these were driving forces for why there's this SB 790 in the first place. And what the, what the rulemaking address, addresses currently, it focuses mostly on the code of conduct and the expedited complaint process. Um, but doesn't dive deeply into the associated rules that are needed to um, to fulfill the obligations set forth in 790. And so that's why when you take a look at our comments, they're quite extensive. And our proposed revisions to the code of conduct are, are extensive. Um, and we highlight a lot of issues that need to be addressed in the present proceeding. So 
One of the key recommendations here is one of functional separation. So if you go to the next slide, please. And essentially what this, this really boils down to a cost shifting issue. And so when you have generation costs that are being uh, sort of shifted through, you know, with it, with, without functional separation, there's sort of a permeable, permeable barrier between generation and distribution functions. Um, and the issue here is that you can load certain generation costs in the distribution function. And so that, that disadvantages our, our customers and CCAs generally. Um, essentially, if you have functional separation, then you can have sort of a chargeback of the benefits of those generation components back to the generation function so that there's appropriate accounting for, uh, for those types of, act for specific activities. So if it's a generation related activity, it would be paid for by the generation rate and accounted for in a specific manner. Distribution system likewise. So you're ensuring that there is a non-permeable barrier and that to the extent that there are, um, that, are, that we are being charged for certain services that their generation customers would also be charged for equivalent services. So essentially treating all generation providers, whether you're an IOU, you know, whether you're a pg e generation entity or a, uh, electric, electric service provider, or, you know, CCA, all of these, you know, everybody's treated on, a, on an equal basis. And so if you go to the next slide, um, I just did a little graphic about, you know, what does functional separation really mean? And so when you have these um, sort of orange boxes, those are generation costs. And what happens if there's cost shifting occurring? If, so there, if there's an improper allocation uh, or counting of costs, what can happen and what we've seen happen in, in various circumstances is you have certain generation costs being shifted into the distribution rate and so that inflates the distribution rate and creates an artificially low generation rate. Um, and the result of this is you have a CCA generation rate which comprises the entirety of generation costs um, you know, CCAs are not able to charge distribution customers for benefits that they create and so on and so forth. So it's sort of a pure generation cost equivalent to what the IOU generation cost is. But our customers are also paying a fraction of generation related costs, um, whereas you have, you know, bundled customers paying sort of a subsidized generation rate and the inflated distribution rate. So it's sort of, you know, whether under either system, the bundled customer is essentially indifferent, but our customers are not. Can I ask you a, a, yes. a naive uh, question, perhaps? Was, is it, with all your experience at the PUC, feasible, possible, politically, uh, and, and reality that as a matter of public policy, that, um, that the PUC would say, hey, we really want to support CCAs, and so the way we're going to subsidize them is, is just make pg and eat the distribution costs and not charge us so that we get to basically use the system, but we have to do our own generation. No. That's yeah, never, no, we're, I mean, we're. It's never going to happen. We're always going to have to, like, rent the distribution system. Well, it's not that, it's not that we're renting the distribution system. What's happening is, and we're not looking for subsidization in any way. I'm just suggesting as a way to promote and make CCAs. When you're, when you're nascent and you're just beginning, it's, it's a way of a public policy to support it. I'm just wondering if, if there's any idea, idea at the PUC about that. No, I, not. no I, I, you know, I think that you know, the, the idea is just that the generation component is segregated out. And so when a customer is looking, they're looking at sort of a, they can look at two options on an equal basis, sort of on par with each other, and determine which one they want to go with. And so, you know, customers are always going to pay transmission and distribution rates. Um, but, you know, what we see as transmission and distribution rates are, you know, you're maintaining the lines, you're maintaining the meters. And, but what it doesn't comprise is certain subsidies to, um, to the generation rate. And I, I can give a couple of examples of that if that, if that would be helpful. No, I'm sorry. It was, just a, it was just a question. I don't want to interrupt you in the middle of this thing. I was just thinking just because obviously pg e has the ability to manipulate, as you show on your teeter-totter there, put, uh, you know, 
pushing uh, items back and forth between generation and distribution. And we really don't. We're only generators. Yeah. And we're beholden to whatever happens on the generation side. And I'm yeah. just thinking, <coughs> yeah. public policy wise, just to give us a little push to get going, that's all. Yeah. And so I think that the way that that CCA can best be facilitate be best facilitated is create processes at the commission that allow for um, transparency to determine what is appropriately generation versus transmission and distribution um, and appropriate appropriately appropriately allocate those costs um, and I think that it there is the incentive uh, for an investor on utility to push cost to the distribution line item to make their com their generation rate more competitive there there is that incentive um, and we have seen that um, incentive um, effectuated or recommended by IOUs consistently and so there's always going to be this you know pushing back of um, and monitoring of how do we appropriately allocate those costs, you know, but our special subsidies and things like that, you know, I don't think that is an appropriate, um, the idea is that CCA should pay for the incremental costs that are attributable to them, um, and there should be a structure created by the commission and under the IOUs that facilitates, uh, creates an environment where CCAs can, can develop. All right, well, you watch pg a card for us, okay? Okay. <laughs> Will do. So, Glenn, yours was really a, a, a cry in the corporate wilderness for pg e to return to its public interest roots? Sort of, yeah. yeah I, think got, I think you got that right. It was a silly cry, but it was a cry. Oh, it's a, a good cry. <laughs> We didn't um, need to interrupt you, Beth. Keep going. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. I like questions and I like interruptions, so it's it's worthwhile. Um, the, on the next slide, um, and you know what we're recommending here is not um, radical. This actually has been recommended in the past as well. For example, when PG&E was in the competitive uh, procurement business, uh, they were heavily involved in Illinois, the state of Illinois, and. Um, when it comes to the code of conduct and functional separation, uh, pg e is on the record as stating that, you know, all electric utilities should be required to comply with standards of conduct and functional separation. That and was 12 years ago. <coughs> but it continues to be the truth. So <laughs> pg and &E uh, also supported CCA. Yes, that's true. Um, and, you know, I think that when you look at it, when you see competitive environments and you know, what the value is of, of competitive environments and what the value is of creating a fair playing field. You know, it, it was interesting in, in, these, um, in these Illinois comments provided by pg e there's a lot of reference to the, the power of incumbent utilities and how do you address that issue. And so when you have uh, an incumbent monopoly, the issues remain the same. And so it's possible that some of the solutions are also the same. Uh, in Illinois, they've had some uh, legislation that has allowed CCA in the state of Illinois, their equivalent, to thrive. And so we do look to models such as that to, to see an improvement. Um, you know, obviously there's, we have California-specific experiences and, and the commission, you know, is autonomous. They can reference other uh, public, you know, public utilities commissions if they'd like. Um, but we do think that there's value in some in looking at other jurisdictions to see what solutions might be available to them. And so um, I do I do really urge uh, folks to to read our comments um, to this proceeding. Um, we're going to be very involved in this going forward. There's a pretty aggressive schedule, and aggressive by commission standards, which is <laughs> we're going to be done by the end of the year. Um, and you know, this is this has been a really um, exciting moment uh, to finally be able to address these issues. And we, as you'll see on the on the filing, you know, we had a we had a large consortium, and a lot of folks are really interested in this and seeing this fixed. And there were a lot of um, supporting communities also on the filing. So we have a very broad coalition. On the next slide, um, another one I just want to touch base on is um, there was a resolution that came out, res draft resolution E4481, 
Um, this relates to virtual net energy metering, which is a tariff that is um, funded for the most part through the California Solar, in Solar Initiative. And um, what we saw at the very tail end of this process, this was a proceeding that we had not been involved in um, due to some um, due to some, our understanding that this would be equally ac applicable to CCA customers. At the very end of this proceeding, there was a recommendation for this to only be available to bundled customers, um, even though CCA customers pay into the California Solar Initiative. And so uh, we filed a, a protest, and there were re revisions made to the draft resolution. And so now um, it, our uh, CCA customers will uh, this, this rate would be available to, to CCA customers. And the reason why this is important is not everybody can have solar panels on the top of their house. So if you're a multi-unit building, you want to have some alternative. And so this could be similar to um, uh, what SMUD has with their solar shares program where you have an off-site you know, solar panel and then you can attribute it to specific accounts. And so it's really beneficial for, for multifamily units, folks who are in the shade, um, and the like. So um, we're excited that you know this you know continues to be the case, and and the commission is very aware that um, that programs that are funded by our customers should be are to be made available to our customers. Um, and then one last thing that I'll I'll touch on, which there isn't a slide on, um, but this this has just been uh, happening. There was the. The most recent filing on this came out actually today, uh, which is why it's not in the slide deck. <clears throat> there was a an advice letter put out by PG&E, um, advice letter 4010E, and essentially what this is is it was a request to approve a C8, uh, combined heat and power contract revision, and um, there was a settlement that was approved by the commission in December of 2010 that um, essentially PG&E is, uh, under that settlement, PG&E procures combined heat and power resources on our behalf and charges us a um, cost allocation mechanism charge. So this is the, we receive the resource adequacy benefits and the greenhouse gas benefits um, of this. We uh, had strongly opposed the settlement uh, agreement since we were not included in the settlement nor were direct access folks um, and it imposes significant costs on us so but that being said it was passed and now given the methodology that we have how do we ensure that there's um, compliance with uh, the approved methodology and there was a combined heat and power uh, contract revision proposal that used an older methodology and didn't allocate GHG resources to our account as required under this settlement. And so we filed a protest to the pg and &E advice letter and uh, both items as of, as of today, pg and &E accepted our revisions and are going to be making corrections to the advice letter. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> these are exciting victories. Yes, how can I? <laughs> Speaking, <laughs> I mean, Speaking of your victories, and, and good for you. Yes, good thank you. you. <laughs> good for us. Um, how does it? How do you decide, or is it you and Don, or how does it, what's the <coughs> procedure deciding which um, filings you're going to oppose, support, how does that, how does that work? You know, because it seems like it's a gigantic volume of, of, of protests and rape filings and all of that, and, and you have to pick and choose your battles, I assume. Yeah, you know, I think there's um, a constant prioritization and reprioritization of tasks, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you're reviewing filings as they come in, decisions as they come in, advice letters as they come in. Um, no, and I guess my question is, do you make the call or do you go to Don and then you and Don discuss together? How does it work? With yeah. we, uh, we, we make a, many of the decisions collaboratively. Um, I think in, in many cases we'll defer to Beth, um, particularly on things that she's been following closely. Um, if it's an issue that relates to some of our technical functions, um, resource adequacy, for example, 
um, smart grid fee issues, we often defer to our technical team or loop them in for kind of a collaborative discussion. Um, we also have outside regulatory counsel through Douglas Liddell, and um, we often uh, seek counsel from, from them on um, which things um, are, should be priorities for us based on their experience. So um, we have, we have a, a really strong team that we can pull from if, if um, we're needing to, uh, to, to do some prioritization beyond what is kind of obvious. But I think uh, Beth does a great job of filtering out what are the, the key important things. And, um, and then sometimes we weed down from there if we don't have resources to take on all of it. Yeah, I was just curious how it worked. It just seems like you must have a gigantic volume of things to look at. And yeah, and, and there's always there's always more that can be done, and, and it's just determining a threshold for sort of a materiality threshold. Um, and, you know, I think that it's worthwhile noting that we really do. It's it's kind of a network approach. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit like the filter, you know? <laughs> so I, items come in and you filter out to, you know, external counsel. Often we, uh, we work in consortiums, and so you'll reach out to other consortium members to see, you know, are you going to be filing on this? How do we... Um, prioritize the importance of it. Is it strategically valuable for us to participate? Um, you know, from a technical basis. You know, are should we be concerned, or are this? You know, is the trajectory of this proceeding reasonable? And so, all of these factors sort of come together. Um, and you know, a lot of times, you know, what happens is, you know, something will come up. I'll find it to be important. I'll bring it to Don's attention. We'll have you know, two minute conversation on it just to just to powwow and then, you know, I sort of go forward and there's sort of a continuous checking in with each other, with, with the technical parties. You know, we have our, our regulatory analyst, Jeremy Wayne, um, external got, counselor. And so, it. sorry, <laughs> that's the long answer, but it's the accurate one. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to melt your mind. No, no, no. no. <laughs> We're no, bored no. over here. <laughs> no, no, I got it. I just was curious how, you know, yeah. I just wanted generally to understand yeah. So, and, and I got a very thorough answer. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, we so we keep you know calendars and uh, and the like and schedules and um, it's, it's um, fun. And if you'd like to <laughs> come in and be a part of the process anytime, I. <laughs> It's an acquired taste that few humans could ever develop. So, you know, I, I always say it and nobody ever takes me up to come into my office and talk regulatory. Right, but I'm hoping somebody will take me up on it. Uh, <laughs> Although I will say that this uh, SB 790 item is, is sexy. Maybe it is. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh. Right. Amen. You yeah. That. And you know, the, it looks like it's very evident you're putting a tremendous amount of time in, and the, and the quality of the work looks outstanding. So, yeah. we're looking forward to kind of keeping in touch on that one. Yeah, and the graphics are fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. But there was, you know, this has been a real. Um, <laughs> group effort here, there's um, two external counsel. One of our external counselors is, um, is Dan Douglas. We work with him consistently. Another counsel that is working on this for several cities and towns um, on this is Scott Blazing. And so between the three of us, we were the primary drafters of this document. Um, you know, so, so it's been a real divide and conquer working together um, and looping in all of our consortium members. And it's been really, um, great to to work uh, with with several new communities um, you know we haven't filed before with for example the city of Santa Cruz um, but always expanding um, the knowledge base and involvement at the Commission it it really sends a powerful signal thank you yeah great. thank you sorry about the very long answer before <laughs> I, I just I kept on thinking about the, the process and I was like we well <laughs> It's involved. <laughs> so I should have just said it's involved. <laughs> I like the details. I can't help it. <laughs> Does any members of the public have any questions on the regulatory before? Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Okay. So. How can you fit all that regulatory awesomeness into yeah, it's a bit, that's a Is that R-A? <laughs> <laughs> we do like acronyms. <laughs> okay, 
<laughs> on that note, I'm, th that's the end of the regulatory. All right, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, moving on to item 13, board member and staff matters. Anything further? Okay, well, great meeting, you guys. We're running to number 14. Stand adjourned. <laughs> All right. Good job. Okay, thank you. Good job. Oh,